at least. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to High Performance at High Noon. I am your host. I'm Jace Johnson. I'm a work-life integration strategist, and I'm excited to have you here for my Wednesday call for my high performers, high achievers. Um, so little, you know, all my regular housekeeping, this call is every Wednesday. It is at uh, 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I want to thank you for joining me. Um, before I get started, um, please share this out. If you find the call helpful, please share the call out. I definitely um, am looking to continue to grow the call. I get questions on the backside from people who haven't been able to join the call in person. And then I also always go back and like after we get off, because it's really like 30 minutes, you know, but we'll get off. And then all of a sudden I'll have like all these people like trying to hop on my, my Zoom will be going off like so-and-so is trying to access your meeting. Like, well, we're done. Cause we start on time, <laughs> but, you know, but at any rate, I would ask that y'all share this out. Um, if you find the call helpful, find the information helpful, of course, you know, the call is free to join. All they got to do is register. So today, um, I actually had this topic prepared for last week and because of some things last week, I decided to actually switch the topic and talk about, um, you know, graceful accountability, right? Like how do we be both accountable and be graceful? But I wanted to make sure I circle back around this topic because, especially just because, you know, thinking through the time of the year, it's the top of the year. It's still the top of the year. I know we just hit February. Happy Black History Month. I'm Black every month, but y'all know <laughs> what that looks like, but it's still... He won, right? So a lot of times people are thinking about like their strategy. They're thinking about what they want to do. They're thinking about how they intend to move. Like these types of thoughts are happening and you, you know, you're either in your plan or you're trying to revise your plan or you started a plan, you fell off the plan, you hoping to get back on the plan, right? Like all these, these uh, spaces. But what I want to talk about today is how to prepare for the rain, how to prepare for all the things that you have been asking for, wishing for, wanting. And I don't know, how many of you remember the movie Facing the Giants? Do y'all remember that movie? I like football. I'm like a huge football fan. I'm also a 49ers fan. So if everyone could just take a moment of silence for the fact that we are not going to make it into the Super Bowl. I'm super glad to see two Black quarterbacks, but also... I'm diehard 49ers fan. Y'all know I'm from the Bay Area. Okay. Um, but I love football. So I love watching football movies. And Facing the Giants, it's like, if you don't know, it's about this high school football team that basically sucked. And uh, they got a new coach and all the good stuff, right? And so um, it's a Christian movie. I really like it. It's got a lot of heartwarming scenes in it. But there's one scene that to me is probably the most memorable scene, right? And so you have this football team and they're, you know, wanting to get ready, but they they know, like they kind of feel defeated up front. So anyway, I'm not going to get into all the, 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 the specifics of it, but ultimately in this moment between these two men, who were, you know, kind of debating out like how to process and how to move forward. He turns to him and I'm, and I'm saying this verbatim. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not saying this verbatim. I am paraphrasing it. But he basically tells them like, you're praying for this season to come, but are you prepared, right? And he goes through like this parable of like how you are praying for the rain. There's two farmers and you're praying for the rain. And like one farmer is praying for the rain so that the crops will grow. And the other farmer is out here tilling, you know, the ground and getting it ready and, and, and planting the seed. So when it rains, you've got one farmer trying to get out there and scramble and it's already too late because the waters hit the soil, but the soil isn't plowed the soil isn't tilled there's no seed planted you got the other farmer who when it didn't look like there was any rain in sight when it looked like there was a drought going on you know that farmer got out there and did all the things that they needed to do and continue to pray for the rain so when the rain came they were prepared and they produced crops and why that has always stuck out to me is because I felt like at that time that this occurred, I had lost out on an opportunity and it was a work opportunity. Um, and so in the big scheme of my life, like probably for the best, um, because, you know, things happen and I'm here where I am today. But in that moment, I was a little bit upset about the opportunity that I had missed. 
And when I heard like, are you prepared for the rain? I thought, wow, like that's profound. And it's something that has quite literally stuck with me. And so I won't, you know, I'm not a preacher sermon-ish type of person. So I won't get into like what specifically that, I, I won't, I won't preach about it, but I do want to talk about what that could look like. And I want to talk about some other ways that we don't always prepare. And I want to leave, I want to start with the example of a job because the thing about opportunities is opportunities come around again. Now, sometimes we take that for granted because it's like, oh, well, I missed that and there'll be another opportunity, right? I, I didn't get that job I wanted. There'll be another opportunity. And I don't want to negate that. That That's actually true. Like opportunities are, you know, sometimes you hear like the once in a lifetime opportunities. And that's also true. Like there are things that are really, you know, very rare opportunities that come around. But for the most part, opportunities, they do come and they go, right? They're kind of like buses. They will absolutely come again. But the question is, how often is it when an opportunity comes that you have missed out of a lack of preparation, especially an opportunity that you have prayed for or an opportunity that you have meditated on or an opportunity that you have visioned on or an opportunity that you have asked for, right? In whatever way you see that higher power being, when you have asked for a thing and then you have not done the work for said thing and that opportunity comes, it takes a while for it to come back around because you haven't proven yourself ready or willing to do the work in order for you to get that opportunity. So what you don't often see is the same type of large scale opportunities coming around over and over and over coming around back to back to back. They come around and then a, a couple of years later, they come back around. You're trying to make it into the C-suite, but you haven't done the work. You're not just going to get another C-suite position if you haven't done the work, right? You could have an opportunity that doesn't hit you, but you've done the work and another opportunity will come. But if you haven't done the work, it's going to be a couple of years before that C-suite opportunity comes back around, right? And I'm just using that as an example, but um. But I want to talk about an, another uh, another example that also struck me with regard to preparation. And then I'll get into some of the things that you can begin to do to prepare. And if you haven't joined the call before, after that, I'm going to open it up for some Q&A, some thoughts, some questions and comments. So y'all know Boris Cujo, right? We know Boris Cujo. Okay. Um, so then, of course, you also know that he's married to Nicole Ari Parker. So now there was a time, and we kind of hear it more frequently now with... Um, Sierra's prayer, right? Sierra prayed for her, Russell Wilson. Okay, cool. Prior to that, um, Nicole Ari Parker, she talked about this space where she had been like wanting to be in, the, in a certain type of relationship, but she also talked about the type of person that she wanted to date. And so she was having all these requirements like, oh, he needs to love to travel. You know, he needs to be healthy and take care of himself. He needs to, you know, all these things, right? And what she, what she said came to her one day as she was like praying about these things is like, Okay, but are you ready? So it had dawned on her that she's asking for a man who travels and her passport was expired. And she was like, oh, like he could be ready to travel, but I'm not even ready to go travel anywhere, right? She had talked about the space of like her own self-care where she was like, I want a man who like takes care of himself. I want a man who's healthy. And, you know, she was like, oh, like I'm over here hopping out the shower and not even lotion and I'm ashy all over. Like I'm not even taking care of my own skin and hair and nails and body and all these things. So how can I ask for these things? And I'm also not, you know, implementing the things that I want or making sure that I'm prepared in order to meet that or match that type of energy. So think about how you might show up in ways where you're asking for something, where you're wanting something, where you are wishing for something, visioning for something, and then ask yourself, are you actually putting in the work and preparing for that opportunity when it comes down the pipe? So I want to talk a little bit about um, some things that you can be doing and thinking about as you get into that space, right? So first I wanna talk about training and studying. Um, quite often we wanna get into another level of something that we are already passionate about or that we already love. One of the things that has frustrated me, and this comes from my now eight years specifically working with entrepreneurs and professionals around how to grow their business. Oh my God, how we really struggle with the concept of um, investing in our development and our skill sets. 
So we are, we potentially are naturally good at something. And therefore we think that that's the end all be all. And because I know how to do it, I don't actually spend time um, developing that skill. And there's also peripheral skills around what you want to develop. I can like specifically for entrepreneurs, specifically for entrepreneurs, if you have a thing that you do, a widget you sell, a service that you provide or whatever, that's awesome. However, you also have to spend time learning how to do business, like how to read contracts, how to understand terms and conditions, how to market, how to advertise, how to brand, how to sell. All those things sound like they're the same, but they are not, right? Like there is the way in which you build awareness about what it is that you do. There is a way in which you specifically target the people that you want to come and buy from you. There is a way that you um, that you work on getting leads that are qualified to to the thing that you want to sell, right? Then there is the way that you actually sell it to them. It's not the buy, you know, build it and they will come. Like you have to market and sell to them. There is the brand that you build so that people begin to know who you are, what you're about, what you look like, all those, you know, all those things, right? Um, then there's like the process of actually keeping up with customers afterwards. There's a process of you understanding what your sales cycle looks like. Um, that's before you even get into your accounting, your legal. There's so many aspects to what that looks like. There are people who sell a widget because they know, or there are people who sell soaps and lotions rather, rather because they know how to create soaps and lotions in their kitchen, but don't do the work to figure out how to scale it to an industrial size kitchen or how to how to put their formula in at, with a manufacturer who can manufacture it for them. So then they never grow to the scale that they need to be because they haven't invested the time into learning how to improve on the peripheral things outside. So now when an opportunity comes, now all of a sudden you have Marriott hotels who's saying, "Hey, we want to invest in more, um, you know." Uh, BIPOC, uh, you know, businesses to put their soaps and lotions inside of our hotel chain, and you don't know how you're going to scale your operations. When we talk about on the professional side, if you're not an entrepreneur and you are in the career field, right, and you want to grow into the next level, how often are you actually spending the time to figure out what requirements you're missing in order for you to qualify or in order for you to stand ahead, you know, head and shoulders above the competition when you want to move to the next position or to the next department? So then all of a sudden the seat comes open, but you don't qualify. And sometimes we don't do that work because it feels so far down the line. I remember when I was in the military. So when you go and get a promotion in the military, it's based off of need. They only need so many E5s. They only need so many E6s. They only need so many E7s. So as people phase up and move around, it opens up slots. And when a slot is opened, you got to be ready to go for it or you don't make it. It's not automatic. So when my shop, I remember being, when I came into my shop, I was the lowest ranking person in my shop. Everyone else was above me in my shop, but I was putting in some work. So I started doing all the work to figure out how to get my rank for my E5. I started gathering up all the points that I needed. I started making sure that I uh, attended some board studies. I started talking to some of the NCOs who started helping me prep and prepare to go through my training. When the position, when when my NCOIC, that's the, the non-commissioned officer in charge, when my NCOIC moved out of our shop, that space became open. Guess who was the only person prepared to move over and take over the shop? Me. They hated me. I actually really struggled because the other four people who were above me and all of a sudden I leapfrog and became above them, they hated it. But at the end of the day, I was the only one who was prepared to take over that shop when our NCOIC left. So how do you think about the process of actually spending the time to think about what you need in the next level in order for you to prepare? Then you got to think about your networking piece. Who do you need to know that's going to help you when the opportunity presents itself? Who do you need to make friends with? Who do you need to be aligned with? Because regardless of whether we believe in nepotism, it exists. If you're not familiar with the concept or the term of nepotism, it's basically doing business with the people who you know and like. 
So the reality is, as much as, as it's not fair, the truth is, if you present yourself with all the qualifications as the next person, so you eliminate qualifications inside of your opportunity, right? Your desired opportunity, eliminate qualifications. If I know you and I like you, I am definitely going with you over the next person. Now, if your qualifications are closely matched, I might still go with you because I probably think I can help you close the gap. If you're far, if you're too far below, I can know you and like you and know that there's just no way I can put you in this position. You're not qualified. But if you close that gap and I know and I like you, it's a wrap. Matter of fact, I have to pull myself regularly out of opportunities to judge things because I know too many of the entrepreneurs and professionals involved. I'm like, yeah, I know and like you. 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 I can't even do this, guys. I got to get some impartial people in here, right? But the reality is, is that the world operates off of nepotism. And we could disagree with it. I totally do. I, I disagree. And also I use it to my advantage because it's real. I know when I can make a call and say, hey, just so you know, I'm trying to get into this opportunity. How can you help me out? So when you're thinking about what is the next phase or as you are thinking about growing for your opportunities, who do you know? And if you don't know anyone, how do you start to get to know someone? How do you start that process? So you got to think about your network. Your network is super key to going into the um, into your next um opportunity. Matthew said, I recently had a situation in which a spot opened up and I was qualified for, but, and they chose me because they like me the best. Exactly. It, and that's, that's super real. That's super real. Okay. So training, study, and networking also researching. So there's a the aspect of you already knowing like what's what you need to know or what you what like how to close some of those gaps. But the other side of that is how do you make sure that you're up on your industry or you're up on the opportunity? You're up on what's coming down the pipe. Like we're in the process of right now of opening up an economic development organization. In creating that organization, I had to start signing up for lists. I had to start doing some research and reading. We had to start finding out about how the membership opportunities worked. We had to start finding out what we should be a part of. We had to start like plugging in. And every day now I start getting these emails all around economic development organizations and, and all those different types of functionalities. So I have to continuously engross myself in understanding where the industry is going. So I have to make the right types of connections in places where they might get information before I would get information and then say, hey, so what you hear about over there? Tell me about it. So I know what's going on in my industry, right? So how do you begin to think about this, the aspect of researching? Are you connected to the right newsletters? Are you connected to the right associations? Are you connected to um, the right, um, you know, LinkedIn channels or the right, uh, you know, social media platforms, right? So we get on all the world star and hip hop BS, but like, are we on the things that actually affect our industry so that we can be prepared in that industry? Um, right before we started the call, I was just talking to... Jasmine on here who sent me a link um, for real estate. Why? Because I'm in the real estate industry. So, you know, it's like, how do you stay up on what's happening in these spaces and in these places so that when an opportunity presents itself, you're prepared and you're ready to move forward with the opportunity? Or are you going to be caught like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know about that, right? How many of y'all are seeing the whole conversation around AI? Don't sleep on it. Be ready. <laughs> like, it's here. To what extent? I don't know, but I'm learning. Like, you know, how many of us are not up on understanding cryptocurrency or up on, on understanding Web3? I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to understand Web3. Like until they called it Web3, I didn't know we was in Web2. So I'm like, oh, like how do you catch up on those things, right? Because there's opportunities that exist in these spaces that are going to align with something that you've been wor uh, working on. So how do you make sure that you're ready for that? So the next one I want to touch on is mental and emotional prep. Like if you are a person that is trying to move up, 
How are you preparing yourself both mentally and emotionally? And that could look so different, but like, how are you prepared to leave something to move on to the next opportunity? How many of you have ever built something and then it was time to walk away from what you built? I can't be the only one. If you have ever built something that was fabulous or something that you love, it's like your baby, right? You built it. And then it's time for you to move on to the next opportunity. And you've got to emotionally prepare yourself to walk away. How many of you have ever tried to grow a business, but haven't been able to walk away from being in the business so that you can work on the business and hire people to work in the business? right? Like it's hard to think about how you're ready to move to another space, but how you have to actually prepare yourself in the space that you're getting ready to leave because that may be a thing that you are emotionally tied to. How do you increase your tolerance to risk? That's emotional because sometimes you have to take a chance when the opportunity presents itself. And here's the thing about that, because we've talked before about how you see yourself, right? And that's another space of the emotional preparation. How do you see yourself? How many of y'all have ever seen like the show, like any show, right? Where there's this big cliff or one building to another building and, you know, think about like Neo or whatever, right? Like they run up to the edge and they don't quite think that they can make that leap. So they don't, they don't leap. They run and then, oh, they Go back. Oh my God, before they fall off the side, right? But you got the other person who runs, 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 and then leaps off. That person had to believe that they were capable of making that jump before they left. Now, we've all seen a show where they left, then then they fell, right? I'm not saying that you're going to leap and you're going to make it. That's a risk. But if you don't believe yourself to be the type of person who can make the leap in the first place, you're going to be the person who runs right on up to the edge and then pulls back. So who are you? And how do you prepare yourself to make that run and make that leap? That's a risk. So how do you think about increasing your tolerance to risk, increasing your ability to take on or manage the risk that's going to come? So I'm going to talk about two more, financial prep. How do you prep yourself financially for the opportunities that you want? You want to do this big thing. Like you want to get into the, I don't know, entertainment industry. So you need to make a move to Atlanta or a move to New York or a move to L.A. How do you prep yourself financially in order for you to pursue an opportunity or in order for you to make a move when an opportunity comes? I had an associate recently, they weren't a friend, just someone who I knew, who wanted to make a move to another state for a job. And the job was willing to reimburse them for their moving fees. However, they didn't have the upfront money to make the move. They didn't have the upfront money. They didn't have the upfront credit. So even though they were going to be able to get the money back, they actually couldn't make the move. Now I had, in my mind, I had all types of ways that that could have worked out, but they weren't even willing to take the risk. If it was me, we would have been putting our stuff up in storage. We would have been moving over into a studio or something. We would have been taking a drive instead of a flight out. We would have been taking Amtrak. But that comes again with like a risk tolerance, right? Because when I had this conversation, they were scared to make anything other than a holistic move from one place to another. So what happened? They missed out on the opportunity. They weren't ready. They weren't ready financially. They weren't ready to take a risk. But they had put in the work to get there. That's how they got the job opportunity in the first place. So the last one is how do we learn from missed opportunity? What happens when you have an opportunity that did come that you did miss? Have you taken time? Do you take time to then assess how you've missed that opportunity? What took place and how you can make sure that that doesn't happen again? So that you can put in some dedicated steps if you're still going after a similar type of opportunity, if you still want that thing, how do you make sure that when that thing comes around again, that you're ready this time? Because a lot of times when we have something that we miss, 
uh, many, many, many of us actually just give up. And maybe you can think of a time that you did that, that you wanted something and then you gave up because it didn't happen, right? So um, I'm going to stop here and start opening up for some Q&A, but I hope that this was helpful. Did anybody find this helpful to think through how to make sure that you're prepared for the rain that you're asking for, how you think about tilling your fields and planting those seeds so that when the rain that you're asking for comes, that you're actually ready for it and those crops grow? I hope that, I hope that this is helpful. Who has questions? Who has thoughts? Who has comments? I have a thought. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I think one of the things that probably um, I would need to have more information on is when you said risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a high risk person. Okay. Um, and I think when you hear people like yourself who are, it's like you got to be able to find that place where your risk doesn't take away from your opportunity, but you have to learn how to maybe move the risk, you know, the needle. Does that make sense? It does, yep. Okay, okay, that. So there are ways that you can increase your tolerance to risk, right? Um, and I'm gonna write this down because what I, what I can commit to doing is talking about increasing your risk tolerance. But here is what I would say at a high level. There are, there are specific things that you can do to increase your tolerance to risk. One of the easiest things that you can do is to increase your knowledge on something. Like for example, if you are wanting to buy, um, I'll use like, let's say you wanna buy an investment property and you've never bought an investment property before. It's a risk because you don't have any clue as to how you're gonna run it, what you're gonna run into or anything. But if you spend some time taking some real estate classes, specifically real estate classes for investors, specifically real estate classes for first time investors that will talk to you about how to look out for some of the pitfalls, what are the things that you should be aware of, how you can mitigate some of the things that could happen, what types of insurances or processes that you wanna put in place, right? As your knowledge base grows, your tolerance to that risk begins to also increase because now you feel like, should you run into something, you may just know what to do and you may just know who to call to help you walk through it. So you increase that from going from here's an idea and something that I want to do, but I know nothing about it. So everything about it scares me shitless to now I understand some things. Now I understand some things. Now I understand some things. I think I'm ready to try it because I have some resources, some knowledge, some tools and some networks. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense, but I need you to connect the dots for me. Okay. Because one of the things that I feel that I do as a Black woman is I got to show up with experience while my counterparts get to show up with potential. So it goes back to what you were saying with nepotism. Like, I got to go out and do all this research, which I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. But then I meet Becky, and it's Becky's uncle who's doing the hiring. And, and, and that's, and because you said that's a real thing yeah. and, and I'm, I just, I just want, you know, perspective because I know that what you say and everything you say, and these are very good sessions. So thank you, but I know it's good, but it's a challenge because it seems like we're constantly fighting that edge. We're willing to jump over. We're actually willing to make that leap, mm -hmm. but it seems like other people get a ladder. Does that make sense? It does. So, but I, but I think that we're splitting hairs in between your ability to take risk and then like some of the other obstacles that might be in your way, right? So you going after an opportunity um, that maybe has certain hurdles or obstacles like a lack of network or maybe a network that's not as strong is a little bit different than you working on increasing your risk tolerance. So I think when it comes to, let's say, for example, let me use your example of Becky and Becky's uncles doing the hiring, right? Um, what might be beneficial is building an alliance with Becky. What might be beneficial is, you know, who is, who is uh, uncle's competitor and going to have some conversations with the competitor and building uh, relationships on that side, right? For, just for an example, like we're, 
we're talking about two different things. When we're, when you're addressing your ability to take risk, the first thing that you said is that you don't take a lot of risk, right? Like if you find yourself to be conservative on the risk side, what you'll find is that that, conserv that conservation can be in multiple areas of life. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be with where you are in business. It could be how you handle your money. It could be how you handle relationships. It could be how you handle um, opportunities that are in business, right? So it can expand to a multitude of different places if you struggle with taking a risk in general. And you'll see that across the board. If you struggle with making uh, an an investment in the stock market, you may also struggle with going out on a date with someone because you're afraid of what the consequences are if the if the relationship doesn't work out. Like somewhere, Hell no, he's fine. That's all you got. He's just fine. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's the space of where you work on there is a thing that may not work out the way I want it to and I'm still willing to take steps towards it right so I can like let me use investing as an example when you go to invest inside the stock market how many of you know that you can lose money okay also how many of you know that you can make money what matters the most to you? Are you more concerned about your potential loss or are you more concerned about your potential gain? And if you wanna start taking incremental steps there, then you only put in what you can afford to lose. But at some point you've got to increase your ability to lose. So if you are okay with putting $50 in the stock market because worst case scenario, I lose $50, then start there. But when if you lose the $50, how do you emotionally handle that so that you can give it another try? Because if you lose the $50 and you never want to try the stock market again, and someone's like, oh, you don't invest in stocks? No, because 10 years ago, I put $50 in the stock market and I lost it all. And I'm never investing in that again, right? Like some people think this way. So it sounds really silly, like $50 from 10 years ago, but some of us get so emotionally scarred when something doesn't pan out the way we want it to, that we never attempt to go back towards that thing again. So I use that like kind of silly sounding example, but there are people that never, go, and you would faster go to the bar and spend $50 buying drinks than you would invested in the stock market. Because now you have the physical drink, you can drink it and you feel like you've tangibly touched something. So you know where your money went. But if you're so scarred that you put it in the stock market and the loss of that feels intangible and now you feel like you, it's like you feel like you were walking down the street and you threw $50 into the wind. That hurts you more than wasting it at the bar. That hurts you more than wasting it on Chick-fil-A because Chick-fil-A will absolutely cost you $50. <laughs> But like, that's the space of risk. So when you're thinking about risk, I think you need to look at how do you assess risk overall as a concept so that you can begin to come out of that space. So what happens if Becky's, uh, you know, uncle is the one that gives her the opportunity? What have you risked by going after the opportunity? And then what can you learn from missing the opportunity? Because if the only thing you can see is the nepotism in it, like how do you outperform Becky so much? that Becky's uncle is struggling to figure out like he's like dang like that's my niece but I don't know now I'm not saying that that's fair but now we're talking about two separate things that's not the same thing as risk does that make sense what I'm saying yes it really does thank okay. you that's very good awesome Jasmine you were going to say something you came off mute I did. What was I thinking? I think it was uh, along the lines of preparing and making sure that I'm up on my industry and opportunity. And I think you ended up saying it about AI being like the thing, <laughs> you know, um, and one AI, two, you know, with the, the markets right now, um, real estate market, interest rates and all of those things, um, a lot of the moratoriums being left, you know, I think we're doing a pretty good job at shifting, focusing on things like pre-foreclosures um, and subject to deals versus just straight, you know, purchasing and wholesaling. So I do think that we're working on that uh, in, a well, in, a, in a good way. But as far as preparing myself to leave the thing and move on to the next opportunity, so for us, you know, I think it's um, trying to get to like a, a happy medium because, you know, I do a little bit more uh, personal development than my counterpart. 
And so it's part of like pulling like, okay, come on one, one step at a time. And so I think we're, you know, fairly good place. So we do have two virtual sense assistants now, one making calls and one doing some data things, but then it's like getting to the next part of, of trying to paint the picture of what that potentially could look like. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, you know, one is I'm going to be starting with an org chart just to try to give that visual of like, okay, well, this is kind of where we would like to get to and where we are now, you know, and kind of doing a comparison um, of that, but yeah. interested in your thoughts. So I don't know. Awesome. Well, yeah. And I think like making sure that you're spending time thinking about what the next level actually looks like. Right. And then that will help inform what you need to do to prepare for the next opportunities. Because I think just knowing a little bit about your real estate journey, I think you've done a great job with trying to like with preparing to get you where you are. So as you either think about how to expand or grow that or think about the next level and what you want to do inside of that inside of the real estate space would help inform your steps on what you need to do to prepare for those opportunities. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah for sure, for sure. Awesome. who else any other thoughts all right well, i do have I, a brief a brief thought uh, oh yeah really I, and and i don't know if it's connected but what i would like to hear too is how to seek feedback <laughs> Like when you have taken a risk and you haven't gotten what you needed, if that makes sense. Like that, I know you're not talking about that today, but feedback, I how know. How to get feedback? Well, how to get it and how to receive it. I And, and I know you might think, well, you just receive it, but it's uh, um, no, for me. It's like, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. For me, like with a small business, I mean, sometimes, don't get me wrong, I know that no, no is a final no is a just not right now. But sometimes you can be sitting at home, like up in your head, like, Jesus, I'm tired of the no's. Now I got to call and I got to figure out why they didn't want me to. So I don't know if this is a part of that conversation. It might be another one. But feedback, I think, might be a part of helping, at least for me, the risk of being able to go, go, keep going. Right. Yeah. So what I would say is that I think that would fall into like, how do you learn from missed opportunities? Right. Um, and, and, I, and you're saying something I actually want to hit on, which is a missed opportunity isn't necessarily always because you're not prepared. Right. So I, I think I don't know if you where you came on, but I started off like mentioning that like you can have a missed opportunity and you could have been prepared. So another opportunity presents itself. It's really along the lines of when you have a missed opportunity or when you have missed an opportunity due to lack of preparation, which oftentimes happens because we want something and we don't spend the time preparing. But if you have spent the time preparing and an opportunity that you know you went went for and you didn't receive that opportunity, I would 100% go back and seek feedback. Um, and 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 in seeking feedback, like you could literally ask that, like, hey, you know, so and so, uh, appreciate the opportunity to have you know try to get your business or try to you know work with you. Um, I would love if you have any feedback for me as to why I didn't get that, um, because sometimes, and this is just the reality of it, like sometimes things are just competitive. I I have one slot and I've got you know six qualified people. What makes me go after one over the other is probably going to come down you know to to minute things. So like the first level of of preparation in that space is like making sure that you even out like some level of the competition by making sure you're knowledgeable, you're prepared, you're this, that, and other. Then there's going to be little things that just seem to make a difference over, you know, other things, right? It could be schedule, availability, where somebody lives, if you know somebody, um, you know, and there are other things that can factor into that, but your ability to be prepared for an opportunity is like level one, right? And then when you go back and seek um, information about said opportunity, like you're always able to go back and implement that if you find something useful. You might find that it was an opportunity that just wasn't meant for you because the person who received it, you know, like it could have been Becky's uncle. There's nothing that you can do about that 
if all other things are equal. What you wanna make sure at minimum is that all other things are equal. But once you receive that feedback from an emotional standpoint about it, um, or even a tactical standpoint, like if you receive feedback that you're able to actually implement into your business service career or whatever, like if it, if that resonates with you, I would absolutely do that. But if you are, if you find that when you seek feedback that it cuts or it hurts or whatever, first of all, things that cut and hurt usually um, is because you feel some sort of truth in it, right? And so that's a place of assessment, but also there's an emotional intelligence uh, aspect that comes into play to be able to receive that information and process it and then figure out what to do with it. And there was a book somewhere, I feel I probably have it on my wall somewhere, that's like how to receive feedback. Oh, dang. Well, that's how, it's a title of a book that's like, no, it might be in my other bookshelf. There's a title of a book, um, that speaks to that. And it's like, how do you receive feedback even when you didn't ask for it? Uh, it wasn't given to you well. I mean, people can say some rude, mean things, but if you say something rude to me that I don't believe to be true about me, I just look at you like you're like, what? Like that doesn't even make sense, right? Because I, I don't feel any of that. So if you feel it, if you say something crazy to me and it cuts, I'm like, oh, if it cuts, I might need to go back and assess. Like, what did you say that actually you know, poked at something that was tender. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes total, total sense. That's very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add that, like, I'm going to do one on risk on, on, um, on how to increase risk tolerance, but I'll see about like what happens in the space of like, let me think about that. Cause I need to think through some ex experience shares. Like I try not to get on here and just like preach, but also like, how do I share my experience in that space and how it helps me move forward. Right. So I do, I need to go back and like, think about like receiving feedback, um, and what that looks like, but I'll, 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 I'll look and see if I can be useful in that space. And, and let me give you a little, uh, uh, kind of perspective too, because you said if it cuts, it might be some truth in it. One mm -hmm. of the things that I've learned when, um, especially there's such an increase of a small businesses increasing, especially amongst black women. Um, I've been at places where when you haven't done this before, you don't necessarily know the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So I've had to tell people who come back at me, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Now you get to go in and put up drywall, but you want me to come in and build a building. Like, like that's just not fair. Mm -hmm. So, so don't, don't judge me on what I don't know. Mm -hmm. Work with me on getting to the place of knowing it. So, so um, with that being said, I just look forward to the, well, the information you'll give us regarding, you know, being able to receive feedback. Yeah, so, I will do you. that. But let me, let me, let me use this moment to say, to, um, to respond to that real quick. So I think one of the things we have to be okay with, and that's why I talk about my coming into like new industries, right? Um, if you are going to step into a space where you're recognizing, I don't have this information, sometimes you have to think about how you're approaching the opportunity. Like I'm not, shoot your shot, right? But if I know, and I'll give you an example. So I, I, I just started going into the space of venture capital. Well, really over like the course of the last like year or so, I'm not aggressive about it or anything. I just keep showing up in the space of venture capital. Um, and at this point, as I've learned more, I have a better idea about where I want to sit in the venture capital world. But in the meantime, in between time, I can't tell you how many conversations, like right now in Denver, we started a fund called the New Community Transformation Fund, um, Denver, right? And so it's a $50 million venture fund. Now, first of all, I'm the co-founder of it. Second of all, I brought the opportunity to Denver. That's me. That's my work. I brought it here 110%. Everyone that's involved in it came here because of Jice. However, Jice was the least experienced person out of everything, out of everyone, so I kept coming to appointments, meeting with high people. Like I met with the market president of banks. I was meeting with people of foundations that had checks. Like we have a $2 million check. Where are we going to put this check? And I would sit down with them. I'm sitting down with someone who's telling me they got a $2 million check and I know nothing about venture capital at all. 
I can't be offended and tell them, well, if you just want to work with me because, you know, I've done all this work with Black businesses and you want this money to go to these Black businesses. And, you know, I know these people in venture capital and I'm willing to learn about venture capital if you would give me a chance. That didn't matter to them. I was told over and over and over again, come back when you have the money person. You're not the money person. I was lit like, I literally sat down in this man looked at me and he was like, well, you're not the money person. So come back to me when you got the money person. Oh, shoot. Like, okay. And it cut. And I was like, oh, well, you know what, Jice, you're not the money person. So I went and found a money person. The money person is running the fund. I can't run the fund. I'm not the money person. They were hundred percent right about that. But the next time I showed up in their face, I had the money person next to me. So there is a time and a space where you might really not be qualified or prepared for the opportunity. Then you got to keep doing more work and keep doing more work. So and it could be the type of industry we're looking at too. A service versus a mm -hmm. uh, professional versus a um, 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 uh, products. So the, the industry itself could make a difference on how that approach happens as well. A hundred percent. And I mean, like taking, yeah. you know, like taking for what, for what, you know, matters to you and what feels fits in your space. But ultimately when you're thinking about, you know, what an opportunity that you want to seek. And if you get feedback that says that you're not prepared already, go and get prepared already or figure out how to partner or figure out like what's the next thing that you need to do in that, in that area, right? In order for you to come back. When you say, I don't know the right questions to ask, but now that you've sat down and you've listened, you might come back with no more questions the next time. So it might take you a little bit longer to get ready for the opportunity opportunity and a little longer to get ready for the opportunity because every time you put yourself in the line of fire for that opportunity and you don't get it you should come back with something more to help you move that opportunity forward I hope that may, I hope that makes sense no no it, it makes sense but understanding that sometimes the opportunity isn't based on you going and asking the right question sometimes the opportunity yeah. is the fact that you need the opportunity it's like somebody having a resume and they're like well come back when you get experience <laughs> hello, you got to give me the job first before I can get the experience. But but I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And, um, and, but so that's, that's I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go back to like, what are the other ways, right? So there are ways, like there are ways for you to gather the experience without you having the, the opportunity, the job. It just depends on what you're going to put in. So if I want experience in an area that I'm not qualified or I don't currently have the experience for, maybe I have the education, but I don't have the experience like using your resume, right? I've gone to school and I have this education. I have this education. I've done, I've done these things, but I haven't done this thing but you want experience in this thing and I don't have it okay well now I need to partner with someone who does now I might need to intern maybe I need to volunteer maybe I need to ask for training maybe I need to ask for hands-on training I mean you're gonna have to think about what how that applies to you in that space but ultimately if there is a space that you don't currently have experience and that is being pointed out then it's not I need you to give me the opportunity to gain experience in that space it's where can I go and gain the, the experience in that space? And maybe that experience doesn't look like the way I want it to up front. Like maybe I want a paid opportunity to get that experience and I have to accept the unpaid opportunity to get that experience. But when I do, I'll be, be better for it. I'll give you this last example before I, I hop off um, with using that, right? And it's service-based still, but I'll give you that example. So most everybody knows if you go and look up Jice Johnson, you're going to find Jice Johnson next to basically all things Black business, right? Black business, all the stuff. Um, when I decided that I was going to move over into this space of uh, work-life integration strategy, nobody knows me in the work-life integration strategy space, right? Like nobody knows, what the, nobody knows me in intentional living, work-life integration strategy, none of those things. Nobody knows me. So I just recently got an opportunity. I'm just going to say all the, like, this is my real experience. This is the thing I'm walking through right now. If you were to contact me for black business and ask me to speak, I'm charging you five racks, like five grand, because I've done this work for eight years. I'm well-versed in it. I understand the numbers. I know what I'm talking about. I've built two, I built three organizations in it and I'm working on a fourth one. So when you come to me, you're going to come to me, you're going to have to pay for my experience in the black business space. 
If you come to me in the work-life integration space, I can tell you that I am an experienced speaker. I can tell you I'm an experienced facilitator. I can tell you I'm experienced. I can do a live. I can do live on social media. I can do podcasts. I can do interviews. I can do panels. I can do all those things. I can tell you all of that. I have experience, but not in work-life integration space. So you don't have any history from me. You don't have anything from me that you're going to be able to go back and pull and then apply over here. So when I come over here, I just accepted a, 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 a speaking engagement at a university paying me way less than what I would charge to speak in the Black business space. What I get out of this is one, well, they are going to pay me, but it's not what I would charge. It's far below what I would like far below what I would like. However, what I get in this space is an opportunity to stand up in this uh, capacity in work-life integration. I get to speak for a well-known institution as a work-life integration strategist. I get to record it. I get to keep all those things so I can start to build a name here and I can then go and charge my worth because I'm worth it. I can then charge my worth in the work-life integration space where I can do corporate training or where, whether I can do executive you know, training and things of that sort, but I have to build in this area, even though I am a well-versed speaker. Like I have to make that transition or I have to make, not, it's not even transition, I have to make that expansion to say I can do both. But because I don't have any track record over here, I may have to accept something different here until I build a track record. It won't take me but two or three speaking opportunities before I will be like, actually, this is what you got to charge me. This is what you got to pay. And that's no less than five racks because I will absolutely charge more. So like you have to think about where, how do you look at expanding and where, what you are willing to do to expand. I'm not willing to do those things in certain areas on the Black business space because I don't have to anymore. I put in almost a decade of work on that side. I can change, I have to change that up on the work-life integration side because this is a new space for me. I literally just launched it in November. Does that make sense? I hope that's helpful, I should say. I hope that's helpful. So... I appreciate those questions. Um, just know that I did jot down some notes. So I got you. I got you. I'm gonna do some research and come back. That's what I wanna, that's the space that I wanna be able to provide here. So I hope everybody found this helpful. Make sure that you join me next Wednesday, same time. That's gonna be 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And also please do share this out. If the call is helpful to you, please share it with your friends. Let them know it is free to join. All they gotta do is register. That would help me out as I continue to grow in this space. And I will rock with y'all next week.